How's everybody doing? <laughs> awesome to see you. Hey, it's great having you here. All right. Carl wanted a, a little Bible study here. I thought maybe we might do some principles of biblical hermeneutics. And I know those are some big words. I have to catch my breath here. Um, yeah, not too long ago, I went through a series on hermeneutics, and I, and I have a list of 20 hermeneutical principles that I love, and I thought uh, maybe the, the people of Norway might enjoy that too. So turn with me to 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Um, principle number one. Hermeneutics is simple. Hermeneutics is simple. The first principle is that hermeneutics is simple. To become a master of hermeneutics, to become a master Bible student, you don't need to take a college course on hermeneutics. <laughs> you don't need to read a pile of academic textbooks on hermeneutics. You don't need a scholar listing a bunch of theories so you can understand how to study your Bible. Hermeneutics is simple. God tells you how to study your Bible, and then you do what God says. <laughs> that's pretty much it. That's, that's how it works. Hermeneutics is no more complicated than that. God tells you how to study your Bible in 2 Timothy 2.15. And you apply that principle to your study time in Scripture. You rightly divide the word of truth. That's how you study your Bible. If you want to understand <coughs> how to study your Bible, <coughs> study what the Bible says about hermeneutics. Nothing else matters. If a hermeneutical principle doesn't exist in the Bible, it doesn't exist at all. How about that for an opening? All right. Number two, study includes meditation. The second principle, study includes meditation. And this is a lost art form. Think about that scripture, those verses you read this morning. What? Think about that over the course of the day. Um, 2 Timothy 2.15, there is, Paul opens that verse by saying, study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. And you know what Webster's 18.28 tells us, that study is a setting of the mind or your thoughts upon a subject. This is the application of the mind to books or to any subject for the purpose of learning what is not known before. Learning something you didn't know before. Uh, Webster also told us something else I did not know. Study includes meditation. Carl loves it when I drink coffee while preaching. This is for you, Carl. Cheers. <laughs> that made my wife laugh a little bit. Uh, study includes meditation. Study is not merely you having your nose in a book for hours at a time like you're preparing for some kind of college exam. Study is not spending hours reading commentaries <laughs> or reading excessively wordy articles by some guy named Joel. <laughs> study is just setting your mind upon a subject, and study includes meditation. Think about it. Think about thinking about it. That's you thinking about a verse. You're comparing spiritual concepts in your mind in order to figure out the answers. You're asking yourself questions about something in Scripture and then thinking about or thinking through the answers. We're all accustomed to having a question and Googling the answers, I'm sure. I, don't, I try not to use Google much anymore. But God designed his word for you to meditate upon it. Think about it. And when you meditate, I think he wants you comparing spiritual concepts in your mind. 
Principle number three, show thyself approved. Why do we study? 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us why we study, which very few books mention. We study to show thyself approved unto God. So wait a minute. Do we have to study in order to earn God's approval? We earned His approval. You earned His approval that moment you got saved and you accepted that gospel of grace by faith when you accepted that Christ died on the cross, buried, rose again the third day as a complete and total substitutionary atoning work for all your sins. When you believed that and accepted that, you got saved, which means you earned God's approval. So in what sense then... Are we showing ourselves approved? Are we showing that we're already approved by God? Or are we showing how we got approved by God? Yes. <laughs> In both senses of the word approved, you're showing that you are approved because of your faith. You've shown that you were worthy of that approval because you met God's requirements. You accepted his gospel of grace by faith. You earned that approval because of your faith. You believed and trusted in that death, burial, and resurrection as a payment for all your sins. You're continuing to exhibit your approval status because of your life of faith, even now. Also, your consistent study of His Word, rightly divided, makes you knowledgeable of God's will for today. You have a thorough grasp of the gospel. You have a thorough grasp of who you are now in Christ. You know how to live and how to have victory in your walk. And your study of His Word helps you to live with joy and hope. And all of those aspects of your walk demonstrate that you've been approved of God because of your faith. And through study, you're now equipped to answer every man. So 2 Timothy 2.15 is as much about identification as it is about hermeneutics. You're now living in light of who you are, which is how you show yourself approved unto God. You are showing yourself approved because you're living that life of faith. You walk with love and hope. Because you studied enough to know who you are, you're actively trying to live in light of who you are. And in all of that, you're showing yourself to prove. You're showing yourself already accepted by God because you're living in light of who you are. Number four, rightly dividing is also about context and literal hermeneutics. I'm sure you've heard Carl say a number of times, hey, we got a, I can't, I can't do a Carl impersonation. I'm sorry. But he has said, he has said that, you know, you've got to rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to separate between prophecy and mystery. You've got to acknowledge the uniqueness of Paul's apostleship. In his epistles alone, do we find direction for the church today, the body of Christ? I'm sure you've heard Carl say that many times, but, and this leads us to our next hermeneutical tip. Rightly dividing is also about context and literal hermeneutics. So I'm sure I'm sure most of you have heard, like I have a bazillion times, you need to rightly divide the word of truth, making those distinctions, especially between Israel and the church today, and you have to make a straight cut between what is speaking to us and what isn't speaking to us in the scriptures. But I also learned something new when I put this list together. 
rightly dividing the word of truth isn't simply about making those distinctions when you study. Rightly dividing the word of truth is also about context. You can't make those distinctions that matter unless you are always considering context when you're reading his word. Rightly dividing the word of truth is God telling us to always be conscious of context. And there's another hermeneutical principle at work here also. Rightly dividing the word of truth means that you are also always accepting at face value what you're reading. Rightly dividing the word of truth demands a literal interpretation in order for you to rightly divide it. 2 Timothy 2.15 is as much about context and literal her hermeneutics as it is also about making those distinctions that matter. Uh, number five, let Scripture interpret Scripture. This brings us to 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1 and verse uh, 16. Peter says, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, I suspect that the majority of people listening is well aware of why Second Peter exists. Peter was writing to the members of the little flock, and he explained why he wrote that epistle at the beginning of the chapter, uh, at the beginning of chapter 3. He wanted to stir up their minds by way of remembrance that they would be mindful of all the commandments of the Lord revealed to them through the apostles, because there will be in the last days scoffers just as there were scoffers in Peter's day. And these scoffers were saying, you know, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And this is why Peter would talk about Paul at the end of chapter 3. If you want to know why the prophetic program has been put on hold, read the epistles of Paul. You know, so with this theme in mind of responding to the scoffers, Peter would open his epistle in chapter 1 by reminding his kinsmen in the flesh of their calling and their election of God. Everything God had promised to his people, to his believing remnant, he will fulfill just as each one of those promises are written in the word of God. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. There are no takebacks when it comes to God's promises. And Peter would then, at the end of this chapter, in the verses we read, reinforce to all of to, to all of everyone the, the, the supreme divine integrity of the word of God. He says in verse 16, We have not followed cunningly devised fables. Prophecy is not fiction. What the prophets told you in the Old Testament were not clever little stories. What they told you about the kingdom was never fiction. What they told you about the coming of the Messiah in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ was never fiction. 
What they had promised about his death and resurrection was never fiction. And all that Peter told them about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ was never fiction. He's still coming in all his power and glory. And Peter makes the point to the little flock. Not only had they told them all the truth, but they were also eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he clarifies which majestic event he's referring to. And in verse 17, he says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory where when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So I'd suggest, based on the details he gives us, he can only be talking about the Lord's transfiguration. They were atop a holy mountain when that happened. They heard the Father speak from heaven and say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You remember that transfiguration. That would have been a life-altering event for any one of us. I would have given anything to have seen that. They saw the Lord change His form right before their eyes. His face shined as the sun. His garments became white as light, glistering and dazzling. Mark would write that his garments were exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. The it, we can't even begin to comprehend what a imagine what a, a, a an unbelievably glorious event his transfiguration was. And all that white everybody wrote about, all that white was a symbol of his pureness and his holiness. And when we went through, I went through um, on our channel the uh, End of the World series, I had suggested that the Lord displayed to Peter, James, and John what I'd call his kingdom glory. It wasn't the fullness of his glory. This was a glory that would be emanating from his essence all throughout that thousand-year reign on the earth. And this moment was so epic, Peter would suggest, he'd say, well, hey, let's build some tabernacles to commemorate this moment. But when they heard the Father from heaven say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. The Father reiterated what he said at the Lord's baptism, so there's no doubt as to who is speaking or of his continued pleasure in the life of his son on earth. And after that, the second thing the Father would say to Peter and the others is that they need to hear his words. Hear ye him. Why? Because faith cometh by hearing. Hear ye him. Instead of building tabernacles, how about you listen to my son when he speaks? <laughs> Hear ye him. Don't be wowed only by what you've seen with the glory of the Lord and the incredible appearance of Moses and Elijah. Instead, do something of greater value. Hear ye him. Listen to my son. Instead of building tabernacles, just listen and obey the words of my son, which I'd argue is a timeless principle. We are to also listen to the words of his son given to us through Paul. Hear ye him. It's not enough to just hear him. We must hear and believe, hear and obey, hear and rejoice in him. But then in verse 19, Peter would have something to say contrasting human experiences with the sureness of the Word of God. He'd say in verse 19 here, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. <laughs> 
I love this passage. We first he first says, "Well, we also have a more sure word of prophecy." Prophecy wasn't simply the foretelling of future events. Prophecy was the declaration of the word of God to the people, which sometimes included the foretelling of future events. And I'm sure there were a lot of people in Peter's day who were still alive and had seen the Lord and heard the Lord and had witnessed the Lord accomplish a lot of these many astounding miracles. And I'm sure when people told those stories, they were speaking truth. Now, when Peter shared his own experiences with the Lord, I'm sure he always spoke truth. But there is something even more sure than the true testimonies of eyewitness accounts. Even if those eyewitness accounts were as astounding as viewing his transfiguration, which Peter referenced. The one thing you can rely on more than anything anyone says, the one thing you can rely on more than anything else in the world, is the more sure word of prophecy. The word of God, which is the absolute truth, which has already been settled forever in heaven. And upon which you can rely on the words integrity and veracity all the days of your life above everything else. And notice that Peter says they already had it. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. And that expression makes me wonder if they already had the Gospels in Second Peter was the last of the Hebrew epistles. Thus, Peter could say, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. The members of the little flock already had everything they needed in terms of the New Testament word of God. They had the Old Testament. They had the Gospels. And Peter just completed what would be the last of the Hebrew epistles, presumably. And look at what else he says here. He says, we also we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. Take heed unto the more sure word of prophecy that they already held in their hands. And then he would say, As unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He then equates the more sure word of prophecy, the word of God itself, as a light shining in a dark place. Light in this evil world. And this light will continue to shine until the day dawn. Until the true light, the Lord Jesus Christ, has actually returned to the earth. God's unbound book, the Word of God, will continue to shine as light in this present evil world until the return of Christ, until God's true light, which Peter had witnessed at his transfiguration, until the Lord in his glory will return to establish his prophesied kingdom here on earth. Then Peter would take this idea of the word as light, and he'd connect that idea with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is like the day dawning, the true light having come into the world. And in the minds of the Hebrews, the, the, the return of the Lord is often viewed as the rising of the day star or the, the rising of the morning star out of uh, Numbers 24, 17. Numbers 24, 17, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. The rising star out of Jacob is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who will conquer this earth at his second coming, to establish his kingdom, and have complete dominion over the, over the earth. And so Peter would just brilliantly take this spiritual imagery about the Lord's return and segue into application by 
encouraging them to allow the day star himself to arise in their hearts. Which seems to mean that he wants them to allow their faith in Christ as their Messiah to just deepen further. How would they do that? By taking heed the more sure word of prophecy, by giving themselves over to the word and the New Testament writings, by dedicating themselves to the word of God, which would only deepen further their trust and hope in Christ as their Messiah. And all of that leads us to this famous verse. Verse 20. Knowing this, for, um, let me say that again. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In other words, if you're going to allow the day star to arise in your heart, if you're going to allow your faith in Christ to deepen further because you have taken heed to all that is said of him in the word of God, then you do so already knowing this principle before you even sit down to read the word. And that principle is this. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. The prophets didn't write down their own interpretations of the word of God. The prophets simply wrote down the word of God, regardless of whether they understood those prophecies or not. So if you're going to learn to study the word of God, then you have to take God at his word. The prophets weren't writing what their thoughts were about what God had said. The prophets wrote the word of God itself. And then you read the word of God. And then, and when you read the word of God, you are accepting at face value the fact that you are literally reading the thoughts of God himself. The issue is not... How did the prophets interpret what God said? The issue is, are you accepting that what you're reading is the word of God? This whole line of thought also parallels a crucial hermeneutical principle I've mentioned before. The prophets didn't interpret the word of God for you. The word of God interprets itself. So you come across a reference to the day star or the morning star, and you want to understand what that means. A prophet isn't going to interpret that for you because the word interprets itself. So then you find another reference to a day star or a morning star, and you start thinking critically. And you compare spiritual concept with spiritual concept in order to gain a greater understanding of how you should interpret that expression. That is how God teaches you by encouraging you to dig into his word and compare spiritual concepts in your mind. And this whole principle of scripture interpreting scripture is also a giant refutation of subjectivism. You know, that is, you know, you have people, well, I don't know if they do this in Norway or Europe, but in America, in some churches, you'll have people that sit down and they'll read a verse, and they'll go around the room and say, well, what does this verse mean to you? And what does this verse mean to you? And what does this verse mean to you and to you and to you? Right? That verse isn't about whatever it is you want that verse to be about. That verse is about what God wants you to know and you comparing spiritual concepts with spiritual concepts in order to make sure that you have an accurate interpretation of what God means in the text. You can't get a better teacher of the word of God than the word of God itself. Along with the Holy Spirit, of course. And, um, and he's using this method of comparing those spiritual concepts to help you understand the will of God the Father. And Peter would reinforce this very point in the next verse. He says in 121, 
For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now this verse is mostly used to help explain inspiration of Scripture, right? Holy men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost. But in the context, this verse is meant to solidify in your mind the unquantifiable value of the Word of God because of how it was inspired and written. In other words, you can't get a better teacher of the Word of God than the Word of God itself because all of it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. All of the Word is more sure than anyone's eyewitness story about what they saw Jesus do when He was alive. All of the Word is more sure than anyone's personal subjective interpretation because the Word interprets itself. Anyone who stands up to teach the Word, that person is merely showing the people how the Word has already interpreted itself. What the Word says will always be more important than anyone's private subjective interpretation without any consideration of context or cross-references. Myself included. So to sum up this, that this one hermeneutical principle, we need to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. And this leads me to my next Bible study tip. Number six, actively compare spiritual with spiritual. One of my favorite studies uh, when, when I was digging into hermeneutics was comparing spiritual with spiritual in 1 Corinthians 2.13. Now, people often say comparing Scripture with Scripture. That's not what Paul says. That's not what the verse says. Verses didn't exist back then. Paul's talking about comparing spiritual concepts. The Spirit teaches you by comparing the spiritual concepts in those verses. And Bollinger would make the point that the Greek word for comparing was used in the Septuagint to translate the Hebrew word for interpret. Thus, comparing spiritual concepts is the method of biblical interpretation. Comparing spiritual concepts is hermeneutics. That is how hermeneutics works. You cannot rightly divide unless you're comparing spiritual concepts and you're saying, oh, I see the distinctions here. This concept is for us. This concept over here is not. So I would suggest if you're doing a Bible study, just take one verse, compare the words and the spiritual concepts in that verse. You know, you take, for example, um, a verse we love to use on our podcast, Ephesians 4.32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, there's a ton of concepts to compare and contrast in that one verse. What's the difference between kind and tenderhearted? Is tenderhearted a behavior or motivation behind the kindness you show others? Paul's also begging a comparison between forgiving one another and to do that even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You see that? Why does he talk about God forgiving you for Christ's sake? How is it that we are to forgive others for Christ's sake, just as the Father had forgiven us for Christ's sake? You know, meditate on the way we're to forgive with the way that God has already forgiven you. We forgive even as the Father has forgiven us. Begs a comparison. Are you forgiving in that same manner that the Father has already forgiven you? And you comparing those concepts develops your ability to think critically, to discern God's Word with, with greater clarity, 
And you profit from those comparisons, which you're then excited to share with other believers. And the answer to most questions is usually context, number seven. Because more often than not, the answer was usually in the context or in some good cross-reference. Number eight, look up cross-references. <laughs> uh, number nine, embrace all forms of engagement with Scripture. Some hermeneutical books would say, okay, Bible reading is not Bible study, but I don't think it's necessary to study every time you open your Bible. I tend to embrace all forms of engagement with Scripture. Is it okay to just sit down and read the book of Esther just because you love the story and you want to experience the story again? Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. I would argue that there is a time and a place for studying and a time and a place for reading, too. But there is a distinction between reading and studying. Reading is casual, usually done for pleasure. When you're reading, you're just taking in the content. You're not trying to gain a mastery of the content, and that's what study is for. Number 10, no new hidden truths. Uh, here's another Bible study tip. When you're spending time in His Word comparing spiritual concepts, your goal interpreting Scripture is not to discover some new hidden truth no one has ever thought of before or to find a way to be unique in your interpretation. Your goal is accuracy in your exegesis. When the plain sense of the Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. And I think I'll just leave it there. Ten hermeneutical principles uh, for all the saints in Norway and for my dear brother, Carl Coates, whom I love beyond all words. Um, uh, how about a word of prayer? Heavenly Father. Father, how grateful we are to you for your word, the brilliance of your word, uh, the depths of your word, how endlessly engaging your word is, how edifying and enriching and glorious your word is. And I just pray, Father, that this time talking about Bible study tips uh, would uh, inspire everyone to dig into the word to be great Bereans, to study, to show, thyself, to show themselves approved by you. And that everything we say and do will bring glory and honor to your Son, our Savior. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. There's the top 10 hermeneutical principles. There's a whole lot more. I've got the, a playlist of uh, uh, hermeneutical principles on uh, our channel. Uh, Carl Coach, you beautiful brother, I love you to death. You keep on keeping on, brother. Take good care of yourself. Bye-bye.